Well, you need to look at your choice of clouds. You know what I mean? You choose Azure, you're choosing Azure for a set of reasons. If you choose AWS, you're choosing AWS for a set of reasons. You choose Google, you're choosing Google for a set of reasons, Oracle, IBM. And actually, I think those reasons are important. I think businesses make those choices very deliberately. And when they do that, they don't want a Kubernetes that, that actually hides those choices, right? And, and this for me is the problem with something like a PaaS from a, from a vendor that tries to essentially say, you know, we are your multi-cloud strategy. We're exactly the same on every cloud because you're choosing different clouds for a reason, right? You, you chose that cloud because they do some things you really like. So actually, I like the idea that you, you use Kubernetes on each of your clouds simultaneously to get consistency, but also to get access to what you like about that cloud, right? Um, those cloud relationships for customers are deep. You don't, you don't, if you're a large organization, you don't lightly engage with the cloud, right? You've got to get identity right, you've got to get security right, you've got to get billing right, you've got to get reporting right, you've got to get you know, monitoring right, and all of those things are cloud specific. So, so you're really invested in IBM if you chose IBM or Google if you chose Google, right? So, so, so the Kubernetes should allow you to essentially take advantage, advantage of that investment, right? Um, so that's why I like the idea that we're Ubuntu consistently across all the clouds in their Kubernetes. But each of those Kubernetes really reflects that cloud. You're getting your cloud. You're also getting consistency. So you have as much portability as you can, you can hope for, while at the same time having the option to get right into the cloudiness that you've chosen, right? So, so I think that's an important um, strategic set of choices. That's also working really well. You know, at the end of the day, we can see the growth in 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 in, in consumption of those, and I, I think it far outstrips the more kind of locked down, limited view of a of a, of a single vendor pass that that you can maybe get access to on a cloud. Um, uh, I, I mean, I mean, those cloud companies are kind of incredible. The amount of R and D that each of them is putting into a set of services that you can consume with a credit card is incredible, right? So it's just kind of fascinating to be a partner with each of those large organizations to enable them to, to, to fight the fight that they're fighting, um, uh, to live a little bit vicariously you know, through the innovation and the R&D that they're driving. Um, we get to see a little bit of that, you know, just a little bit before everybody else does. And it's fascinating, right? It's, it's incredible stuff. Um, our role there is, is uh, to essentially make sure that all the housekeeping is clean across uh, those different environments so that people who are operating on two different clouds can get as much of the same stuff as they want effectively uh, without, without being locked into a, a lowest common denominator story. Yeah, and I just wanna double click on that. So, you know, Kubernetes is a bunch of APIs and if you're a business person, you know, you care about consistency of the API experience um, that, that different Kubernetes colors, flavors, uh, cloud variations are gonna give you. Um, and so that point, I think, is a pretty understood point. Um, so why does it matter at, at, at the Kubernetes runtime um, level? Why does it matter that Ubuntu is running it versus something else? Uh, just, I just want to be clear that I'm making sure I'm understanding that. It matters because containers are not that contained. Um, they're not VMs. Uh, you're, you're running on an operating system and you're running on a kernel. And... Um, that detail matters. It matters um, when there's a fire and you have to fight the fire to know what you can assume about what's under there and what you can't assume about what's under there, right? Um, a container is sort of nestled into a bunch of operating system and those boundaries are a little porous. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. Um, the kernel of the operating system is also the kernel of the container. So you can, you can take a, a CentOS Docker image and deploy it to Kubernetes, but the kernel for that Docker image is, is now not CentOS anymore. The kernel for that Docker image is almost certainly Ubuntu, right? If you built and tested that container on Ubuntu somewhere, and then you deploy it onto any of those cloud Kubernetes on Ubuntu, you're not changing anything in that underlying relationship. Mm -hmm. If you built on CentOS, now you are changing something. And again, those details 
are pretty fine grain, but when they when they matter, they matter intensely, right? Something just doesn't work, or it doesn't work potentially for mysterious reasons. Another example is, um, for example, uh, CUDA, NVIDIA CUDA. You've got some piece of NVIDIA hardware, you have a hypervisor, you then have a guest operating system with the kernel in it that has a driver for that hardware. You're then providing an abstraction of that driver up into the container, and you have to have an application in the container that's linked against particular versions of libraries that happen to match everything all the way down, right? In that world, you can see what I mean when I say the container is not that contained. There are choices that the cloud has made uh, uh, that are hardware and hypervisor choices. Then there's the guest kernel, which is typically um, Ubuntu. And we can obviously work with those cloud hypervisor hardware choices to, to make sure that that piece lines up. But then the container has to line up with all of that as well. And if the container doesn't line up with all of that, well, then you may get ABI, you will get ABI issues effectively between what's in the container, what's in the, what's in, what's in the guest and what's in it. And it, this, this is especially true if you're moving containers across clouds. I wanna do AIML you know, uh, on both Google and AWS. And I don't want to have two different containers. I don't want to know when I'm building my container, if that container is going to end up on Google or if that container is going to end up on AWS. So having some commonality in those foundational pieces is really valuable, right? It, it saves you very expensive people doing, you know, very frustrating things, like figure out why it's not working. Um, so so that's that's why that layer I think is is meaningful. That's why people have gravitated to commonality, right? Mm -hmm. It serves the interests of the clouds to be able to say to people, oh yeah, you can run your containers on us. It's the same underlying OS, right? Or believe it or not, yeah, if you want to take your containers away from us, you can take them because it's the same underlying OS. Of course, there's a bit of a fig leaf there because you might have bought into things that are unique to one cloud or another. But it's a it's a sensible lubricant to the conversation of no i'm not locking you in to my cloud because effectively i am working with partners to create a certain amount of commonality across the cloud does that make sense mm -hmm. so again we serve the clouds to make sure that their optimizations are expressed we serve users to make sure that they have this optionality um, and that works effectively in a in a very healthy way well yeah and and so each cloud has their own special sauce that 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 mm. that you know whether it's observability or whether it's managing the scalability mm. of that cluster of Kubernetes or um, maybe something at an abstraction level uh, like operators and all that. Uh, but it's interesting that you know the more you the more you and you as an enterprise invests into uh, technologies that are part of the CNCF and and maybe. You know whether it's Prometheus or this or that and the other that that have their their backbone um, in open source. I think you're safeguarding yourself more and more. And and so yeah, it's not easy because it takes skill and it takes management. Uh, but but yeah, that sounds like the optimal formula if you can get there, right? Um, so uh, that's don't that's use skill and management. You know that that's the stuff that I think is really interesting for us to focus on. Um, you know. It's probably clear. I don't think it's important for Canonical to have, you know, twenty of the loudest developers in the in the Kubernetes upstream project, right? Like it's just not important. We we're very respectful of the people who 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 lead mm -hmm. Kubernetes, just like we're respectful of Oracle leading MySQL, just like we're respectful of you know Red Hat leading SystemD. You know, at the end of the day, um, there's a there's a level of commitment and focus that that demands, and I respect that. Um, and you know, when we lead, we lead with commitment and focus, right? There's no, there's no doubt about that. But we don't compete on the basis of trying to pretend that we lead everything. Quite the reverse, you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's Eiffel that built the Eiffel Tower, but it's somebody else that's, you know, that's painting it and checking that there's no rust every year. That's us, right? So, so. Um, we, we're very committed to uh, um, people's long-term confidence in the structural integrity 
of all of those Eiffel Towers that are, you know, Kubernetes, OpenStack, mm -hmm. Hadoop, um, you know, uh, uh, spectacular pieces of engineering. We don't feel like we need to push, push, push to control any one of those pieces, right? We're essentially a sort of universal maintenance organization. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, there are some areas where I do think it's up to us to innovate and up to us to lead. And this comes to your point about it takes skill, it takes management. All of that free software um, has to be integrated. It has to be operated. It has to be compliant. And that's actually surprisingly hard, right? There's no license cost associated with it, perhaps, right? But there's this enormous intellectual cost, um, uh, professional work cost uh, overhead of integrating and operating and securing and monitoring and managing um, piles and piles and piles of that free software. And so that is where, that's an area where I really do think it's important for us, Canonical, to drive. And the reason it's something that we are in a good position to lead is because we are at that point of intersection of all of the pieces, right? So, um, uh, we may not be trying to hire the 25 loudest committers in Kubernetes and OpenStack and Hadoop, but if you are trying to stitch together a really efficient data lake and private cloud and uh, CAS, then guess what? You're pulling together stuff that you would probably get from Canonical, which puts us right at the integration point of all of that, right? So that is a key area where you know we do um, drive R and D. We are trying to push forward the state of the art to make it easier to operate and to consume and operate more and more open source in more and more different kinds of ways. By kinds of ways, I mean well, operating on Kubernetes is one thing. Operating on VMs on the cloud is another thing. Operating on bare, bare metal is a third thing. Operating on IoT, which is massively distributed bare metal, is a fourth thing. Right operating desktops is a fifth thing it's all open source it's all linux but 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 thinking really through how a large organization um, uh, removes the friction of consuming and integrating and managing and you know doing compliance and security on all of that free software across all of those different uh, environments that's a really interesting challenge and that's one that that that, that i do see us as a, a sort of global r d thought leader in 